Hello, everybody. My name is Bob Wildfang, and I'm with an organization called Seeds of Diversity, which is a national seed saving organization in Canada. We're talking today about how to grow a successful seed saving garden. And what we'll do is we'll plan out how to design your garden, how to think about when the timing works out, how to think about how the spacing would work out to grow lots of seeds in your own home garden, but also have room for produce, vegetables, flowers, herbs, fruit, anything else that you'd like to grow too. When we think about how to plan a seed saving garden, the first thing we'll talk about is how to get the timing right. Some seeds ripen earlier than others. Some ripen in the middle of the season, some ripen at the end of the season, and that's important to think about when you plan things. We'll also talk about how some plants, you, you can take the seeds from the, the food that you eat. So you can grow the food and the seeds together, but other plants, they grow their seeds and the food parts separately. So you have to think about that. We'll also talk about how many plants you should have for seed saving. Um, some plants make lots of seeds, so you don't need very many plants. On the other hand, it is good to save seeds from as many plants as possible. We'll talk about that uh, in terms of the size of the population from which you're taking your seeds. And we'll also talk about the fact that sometimes, like I said, you can grow the same plants for food and for seeds. So that economizes a bit on space and the number of plants, but also bear in mind that some plants produce their seeds at a time when you can't eat them anymore. So you can't eat them and get seeds at the same time. This is all part of the, the puzzle that we'll put together. In the end, we'll go through some examples of how to map out your seed saving garden so that you can uh, harvest really good high quality seeds, but also have lots of food to eat. So when we think about timing, we think about when the seeds are ready to harvest from the plant. And you always harvest seeds from the plant when the seeds are fully mature. You can't harvest seeds that aren't quite ready yet and expect them to ripen somehow off the plant. They have to be harvested from the plant when they're fully ripe. And there are two kinds of rules of thumb about this. Um, about 95% of all of our plants have seeds that come in a dry and brown form, either in a seed head or in a pod. Um, sometimes there's a kind of a capsule that has the, the seeds inside, but you're always looking for those seeds to be dry and usually brown at the time when they're ripe. And that's when you harvest them. In um, about 5% of our plants, the seeds come in a soft fruit. So I have a picture of uh, some watermelon here. We don't often see watermelon with seeds in it anymore, but if you were saving watermelon seed, you'd wait for the watermelon to be fully ripe. Uh, the same is true with tomatoes. You take uh, seeds from tomatoes when they're fully ripe and ready to eat. You do the same thing for squash and peppers and melons and eggplant and, and uh, all uh, fruit that have seeds inside uh, a soft fruit. So when we think about the timing, when the seeds are ready, we have to think about when the seeds are actually ripe on the plant. We'll get to lots of examples of that. For example, in a tomato, the seeds are ready when the tomato is fully ripe. So this is easy. You just wait for your tomatoes to ripen. And uh, as you eat them, you can save some seeds. With beans, there's more to think about. Green beans or yellow beans, um, they're good to eat, but they don't have ripe seeds inside. The, uh, the seeds that are inside uh, uh, a green bean or a yellow bean at the time when you eat that pod, well, the seeds are very tiny, right? They're not mature yet. You can't take those and plant them. You have to wait for the bean pod to ripen fully. And that would look like, uh, like the pod over on the left in this picture, where it's, uh, it's got a, a dry pod. It feels kind of papery. If you crinkle it, it makes a sound. That's the point when the seeds are fully ripe. So if you're saving seeds from bean plants, you have to let some of the pods ripen all the way until this brown dry stage, but you can also pick as many of the green pods or yellow pods as you want and eat them fresh. You get both, but at different times. And this is another plant that we'll use in our examples. Think about what this is. Have you ever seen a common garden vegetable that looks like this? Well, it's lettuce. This is actually what lettuce does when it's about six weeks past the point where you'd normally eat it. It grows a long stem 
It grows about three or four feet tall. And at the top, it has yellow flowers that turn into kind of like dandelion fluff. And just like a dandelion, the seeds are in that, that seed head right underneath the fluff. This is what the seeds look like. They grow just like dandelions, in fact, but tall. And uh, obviously you can't eat the lettuce at the same time as it produces these seeds. So this is what we think about with the timing of it. If we're growing tomatoes for seed and for the tomatoes, that's easy because the seed and the fruit are ripe at the same time. So in fact, you don't have to do anything special. Just wait for the tomatoes to ripen, pick them, enjoy them. But while you're eating them, take a few seeds out and save those for next year. With beans, you can eat some of them at the pod stage when they're nice green or yellow or purple, but let some of them ripen further. And they might take about four weeks longer to ripen to that brown dry stage that's where you'll get the, the hard, full size seeds inside uh, the papery dry pods. That's, that's what you'd wait for, for them to grow, uh, to be fully ripe for seeds. Now, if you're growing your beans for, um, uh, for, for those dry seeds, for eating those, say you wanna make some chili, or you wanna make some baked beans or bean soup, well, you'd wait for the beans to ripen into that full dry stage anyway, and some of those seeds you would eat and some of the seeds you would save to plant. So that's actually pretty easy too. But in thinking about the timing, think about the different ways that beans are used. And then with lettuce, it's a different thing entirely. You can't use the same plant for food and for seeds. Over on the left, that's what the lettuce plant looks like when the seeds are ready. And you, you pinch off the little dandelion flowers and keep the seeds and plant them. Next year, that's, that's easy, but you can't eat the lettuce at that stage. This is about six weeks after the point where you would eat the lettuce. On the right-hand side, that's, that's delicious looking lettuce. But if you eat it, you destroy the plant. You can't save seeds from it. So really with lettuce, you're deciding that some of your plants will be for seed, some of the plants will be for food, and you can think of them even as separate plants. They're separate crops. They're not even used the same way. You don't even grow them the same way. But the timing of it is quite different. There's six weeks of difference between the harvest. So we'll bear that sort of thing in mind. And that'll come up in one of our examples. Let's think about how many plants we need for saving seeds. We mentioned that with tomatoes, you would just take a few seeds out of a uh, out of a tomato, save them for next year. Well, there are probably about 200 seeds in a tomato. So that means every tomato can give you 200 new tomato plants. You don't really need a lot of tomatoes to save a lot of tomato seeds. With beans, it's a little bit different. Every one of those bean pods has between four and seven seeds in it. So that's a lot less than what's in a tomato. Still, a bean plant is much smaller than a tomato plant, so you can grow a lot more bean plants in the same space. And with lettuce, remember that handful of lettuce seed? Well, this is a picture of a handful of more lettuce seed. Every lettuce plant will give you hundreds of seeds. So how many of your lettuce plants do you have to allow to grow all the way up that four foot tall, big stem with the flowers on it in order to get enough seeds? For next year. It all depends how many seeds you want, of course. If you're running a seed company, you might want lots and lots of plants to get lots and lots of seeds. But if you're only saving seeds in your backyard for your own use, maybe a few lettuce plants is enough, maybe one or two tomato plants is enough, and probably a few bean plants might be enough too. Well, we would encourage you to save as many seeds as you can from as many plants as you can. And I'll explain this in much more detail. But the fact is, many plants need a, 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 a large population. You should save seeds from as many plants as possible because the plants are not all exactly the same. And when you save seeds from, say, just one plant, you're restricting the, the vigor of that plant later on uh, in future generations by, by only taking the genetics that are from that one plant and losing a lot of the diversity that would come if you were saving seeds from many plants. Also, um, 
some plants really need to have uh, a good group of, of other plants around them in order to get good pollination. I'll show you a few examples of that. Um, fact is, if you only grow one or two spinach plants uh, and let them go to seed, they might not give you a lot of seeds because of the way they pollinate. They need to have a whole bunch, a whole group of them all together in order to pollinate well. So to review this, tomatoes. Tomatoes are uh, abundant with seeds. This particular tomato here, this is a German giant tomato. Doesn't it look amazing? Uh, it's, uh, it's a good variety. It tastes delicious, grows well. There aren't a lot of seeds in it. Um, you can find tomato varieties that have many, many more seeds, hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Uh, and this one doesn't have very many at all. I would say um, for making tomato sauce, this is a really good variety because it doesn't fill the sauce up with lots of seeds. You can actually just grind this up and with the seeds and all, uh, and you won't even notice the seeds in there. Um, but if you're a seed company, you might not like this one so much because it just, it's just hardly profitable. You don't have any seeds in there to sell. Well, for a home gardener, this is great. Uh, this is a perfect variety because you may not want your tomato to be too seedy, and yet, this still has enough seeds for your own use, right? There are a few hundred seeds in that tomato and you might get half, half a dozen or 10 or, or a dozen um, tomatoes on a plant. So that's still lots and lots of seeds. This is what you do when you collect seeds from a tomato, just scoop out a few seeds while you're uh, in the process of eating it and uh, rub that jelly off of it. Every tomato seed has a slippery jelly around it. That's actually to prevent the seed from germinating too early. If you let the jelly dry on the seed, then it will hardly sprout. I've done this before. I've allowed that, that jelly to, to just dry on the seed. And when I tried to spread the seeds, only about one in 10 would grow. But if you rub that jelly off, then 10 out of 10 will grow. Um, that's how you see them in a seed cow or a seed packet, right? They, they come nice and dry and, and clean like the picture on the right. All I've done is just rub them uh, with my fingers and gotten the jelly off. That's enough seeds for a person to, uh, to be able to grow their own tomatoes again next year. If you collected more, you could give them away at a, a seed swap event. And if you're really keen and you wanna get thousands and thousands of seeds, well, there are other techniques for getting the jelly off too that will be much more efficient than using your fingers. With, um, with lettuce, here's the lettuce that we would eat over on the left and the lettuce that we would save for seeds over on the right. And the difference between these is about six weeks. This is a great example of why we have to plan a, our seed saving garden. If I plant a row of lettuce and I decide that I'll keep a few plants to grow six weeks longer than the others and get some seeds, well, that's, that's gonna leave some plants in the row. After I eat the lettuce, what do I do with the rest of the row? And the, the seed lettuce will still be there for six weeks. So it's, it's not a difficult problem to solve. You can plant something else where the lettuce was, but you have to sort of think it through. How many uh, lettuce plants should I allow to grow for seed? And that, like I said, depends on what you're using it for. Um, I know seed companies that will, will have uh, hundreds of uh, lettuce plants going to seed and they collect hundreds of thousands of seeds from them. That's where our lettuce seeds come from when we buy them from a seed company. They're coming from lots of lettuce plants. For your own use, you might only need a few. And for sure, you'll get lots of seeds from every lettuce plant because every one of those little little white dandelion seed heads has about 15 seeds. And you might get about a hundred of those flowers on every plant. So right away, that's lots of seeds. This is what the lettuce seeds look like. Um, sometimes we clean them up just by uh, rubbing them. You just rub them with your fingers and, and get the fluff uh, away. You can sift them through a strainer if you want. Uh, blow very gently on your hand so that the fluff blows away, but the seeds stay and um, you get them nice and ready for next year. We keep our seeds dry, we plant them again next year. And if you've harvested them ripe, then they should grow perfectly well. I mentioned that spinach would need to have uh, some friends around it. 
And this is spinach. This is a, a, just an ordinary Bloomsdale spinach. Um, but over on the right, what is that? Well, that's what happens if you let your spinach grow too long. Sometimes in the heat of the summer, the spinach starts to grow a stem. And at that point, the leaves get a little bit bitter, a little bit tough. And many people will say, well, the, the spinach has gone, it's, it's bolted, they say. It means it's growing a flower stem. And they'll pull the spinach out and maybe plant something else. Maybe plant some more spinach, maybe plant a different crop there. Um, some people will just let that spinach grow. And it grows into um, maybe about a foot and a half tall uh, group of plants, which, which you see on the right. The little brown flowers that you see in that picture are making pollen. And the little light green balls that are sort of along the stem, those are the seeds. And the way this works is that the pollen comes from a different flower than the seeds do. In fact, the, the pollen comes from a different plant. Some spinach plants make the pollen and some spinach plants make the seeds. It's kind of like people in that way. And they, um, it, they, they rely on the pollen to kind of float on the, on the, in the air, on the wind. So imagine if you only had a few of these plants and some of those flowers, the ones over on the left, the brown or the right, the, the brown ones are making pollen. The pollen is sort of drifting out into the air and blowing around. The pollen has to somehow land on the plant on the left. And if you don't have very many of those plants, the pollen just might blow away and you won't get the seeds. If you have more plants all around, then there's more chance that the pollen will just happen to drift in the right direction and land where it's supposed to go and make the seeds for you. This is why people have difficulty sometimes with only one or two spinach plants, hoping to get some seeds, but they don't. Um, whereas if you have, say, at least a dozen, maybe 20 of these plants kind of in a block. So they're not all spaced out in a row. They're, they're in a block, so they surround each other. Then you get really good pollination because when the pollen drifts on the wind, it just happens to land on another spinach plant and you get lots and lots of seeds. When we're thinking about how many plants we should be uh, growing for seed, I always add, a little bit more, like just, just add 10 or 20% more than you think that you should need because sometimes you have to get rid of some. This is really important. This is a, this is a picture of uh, some cabbages. I, were, I, I, I grew um, a kind of cabbage called Houston Evergreen um, for seeds. And I noticed when I looked at all of these cabbages that one of them was different. They were all supposed to be a ball-shaped cabbage, but the the size of a, a soccer ball, but one of them was, was uh, wider and flatter. Um, we call it a drumhead cabbage, where it's sort of, sort of wider and, and flatter than, than, uh, a, than a ball would be. I don't know how that different shape of cabbage got into my seeds originally, but we have to take that out. If we want to keep the variety true, and have the right shape and the right size and, and keep all the characteristics of the variety, we have to look very carefully and remove any that are off of that, of, of that particular criteria for what the variety should look like and what it should taste like and how it should grow. So I took this cabbage out. It's called roguing. It's a kind of a, uh, a it always makes me think of pirates, of, of roguing out the, uh, the, the individual plants that don't match the others. We should do this at all stages, not just when you would normally harvest, say, the cabbage. You can look at uh, your plants when they're little seedlings and see if any are just kind of an off color or a different shape. You can look at them when they're uh, in flower. You can see if the flowers are all the same. You can look at every stage, even at the seeds. Sometimes the seeds will look different. And so we just, we just remove the seeds that have a different shape or size or, or color and make sure that we're preserving all the characteristics of the variety correctly. So the point is, if you think that you might want, say, 10 plants for, for saving seeds, grow 12 or 13, because some of them you might wind up removing. We have some really good examples of this 
uh, just from a couple of years ago when we were growing lettuce for seeds at diversity, we're growing lettuce seeds. Um, on the uh, left, you see some all year round lettuce. It's a nice, um, sort of a loose head lettuce. It has a really nice flavor. Um, but one of those plants, the top one, this is in the left-hand picture, it started to grow uh, its stem a lot earlier than the others. It's taller at this point. And all of these lettuces are a little bit past the point where you'd normally um, eat them. They're starting to grow their flower stems. They're starting to produce uh, the tall stems that will, will grow the flowers and the seeds. But that one, it started bolting about a week earlier than the others. Now, should I save seeds from a lettuce that bolts early? The answer is, if I do that, I'll wind up with lots more lettuce next year bolting early. And I don't want that. Usually you wanna prevent bolting. You wanna keep your lettuce nice and edible for as long as possible so you have a good chance of getting to eat it. So we remove any early bolting lettuce. Over on the right is another example. Uh, this is uh, an oak leaf lettuce. They're all pretty much uniform, except there's one kind of toward the top that looks quite different from the others. And here's a, here's a close up of it. It has a little bit of red in it. It's a, a wider, the leaves are a different shape. I don't know why this particular um, off type wound up in my seeds, but that does happen. And so this one, well, I caught it just in time to be able to still eat it. And that's what I did. I did not save seeds from this lettuce. I ate it instead. And that preserved the variety uh, being all consistent in the rest of them that I did save the seeds from. And when we think about a population, I've been giving some examples of saving seeds from just a few lettuces, a few, a few lettuce plants, or maybe saving seeds from a few tomatoes. But earlier I said, save seeds from as many plants as you can. And the reason is that every plant is a little bit different. So let's think about this row of lettuces. There, there are lots of things that make a lettuce true to a particular variety. They have a certain look, a certain color, a certain size, shape. They might be more juicy. They might have a particular flavor. Um, now lettuces are all different, but within each variety, we expect those things to be the same, right? All the lettuces that are of a particular variety should be the same shape and size and color and flavor. But there are lots of things about a lettuce that we can't see. And what's actually happened is that we have made our lettuce varieties all look the same by making sure by this roguing of taking out any off types so that they're all the same shape and color and texture and flavor. But there are still lots of characteristics in there that we have not made uniform. And that's a good thing. Some of these lettuces are going to be more drought tolerant than others. They just naturally have more efficient root systems and they can access more water. So when it's a dry year, they'll grow better. Some of these are more disease tolerant. If there's a particular mildew that comes along, then some of them will resist that better than others. Um, now, I, I can't tell that in this particular year. See, there's a that sort of hose there. That's that's a drip line irrigation. It uh, it irrigates the lettuce when uh, when it's really dry. So that means I can't tell if any of these lettuces are drought tolerant because they wouldn't dry out with the irrigation there. But what if, what if one of them is really exceptionally drought tolerant and I don't save seeds from that one? That means I'll lose that really useful characteristic in the next generation and all generations from then on. If I save seeds from as many lettuces as I can, there's a much better chance that I'll catch that particular characteristic and it will live on in the future generations. What if there's uh, a particular mildew that would affect lettuce, but one of these lettuces is immune to it? That would be a great thing to preserve. If I only save seeds from one or two plants, I have a much less chance of happening to preserve that characteristic. But if I save seeds from as many plants as possible, I have a better chance of catching that characteristic, that genetics, and passing it on into the next generation. So even if I can't see those things because it's not a drought year, it's not a mildew year, I can't see those things happening, the characteristics are still in there. And saving as many seeds as possible from as many plants as possible will give us a better chance of having stronger, 
varieties and stronger plants in the future. So that's why I'm always saying, save seeds from as many plants as you can, not just a few, even though there are lots of seeds in one tomato, don't save all your seeds just from one tomato. Take them from as many different plants as you can. We'll talk a little bit about pollination now because that has a lot to do with how you plan your garden. And uh, you probably know this already. You've, you've uh, seen other videos about, um, about pollination, about isolation distances between different varieties. So this might be a review but there are three different kinds of pollination, three different categories of plants that pollinate in different ways. Some plants have flowers that self-pollinate. Some plants have flowers that can't do that, so they need insects to cross-pollinate them. That means taking pollen from one flower and moving it over to another flower. And some uh, need cross-pollination, but it's by wind. Remember the, the spinach that makes fluffy pollen that drifts in the air, that's, that's an example of uh, cross-pollination by wind. With self-pollinating flowers, the idea is that the flower is closed up and it has everything inside of it that's needed for the pollination to happen. So each flower makes pollen and is able to make a fruit with seeds. And it generally uses its own pollen to do that. So all the pollination happens inside each and every flower, that means the flowers don't tend to cross with each other. And that means you can plant different varieties of the same kind of plant pretty close by each other. So tomatoes is a good example. This is a tomato flower and we have a, uh, a bumblebee who is trying to get some pollen out of that flower. The bumblebees will do this. They can grab onto a tomato flower and they can disengage their wings and then they they flap their wing muscles. Since their wings are disengaged, they don't actually fly away. Instead, their whole body just vibrates. So it's the wing muscles that make them vibrate, but the wings don't actually flap. And what that does is it shakes the pollen out of the flower, out of the tip of the tomato flower, and she's getting pollen onto her belly. It's sort of like shaking pollen out of a salt shaker. And she'll eat that pollen. It's really good food for bumblebees but it's really hard to shake the pollen back up into the flower, much like you couldn't really get salt to go up into a salt shaker. And so it's very unlikely that she is going to carry pollen from one tomato variety to another and somehow pollinate that other variety by getting pollen into the flower. Tomato um, plants are typically, you can grow, grow uh, the same or sorry, different varieties pretty close together and um, only very occasionally will there be some cross-pollination, usually by a bumblebee somehow managing to get some pollen back up into the flower, but it happens so rarely that we normally don't worry about it very much. We consider tomato flowers to be self-pollinating. The same is true with bean flowers and pea flowers, like the one pictured on the right, and the same is true with lettuce flowers. So our examples today are going to be with tomato, bean, pea, and lettuce, all self-pollinating plants. They're much easier to work with than the cross-pollinating plants because they, uh, they can be put quite close together. Different varieties can be put quite close together. Unlike cross-pollinating plants, which have wide open flowers, this, these are uh, squash. We have a couple of different kinds of squash flowers here. One of them on the left only makes pollen and doesn't make a squash. And the one over on the right doesn't make pollen, it only makes a squash. So there's no way for this plant to make squash unless somehow pollen gets from the flower on the left over into the flower on the right. And who does that? Our friend, the squash bee here. This is a native uh, species of bee called a squash bee. Uh, and you'll very likely have these living in and around your uh, squash. If you grow pumpkins or zucchini, you'll probably find them in the flowers. And it's, it's hard to tell a squash bee from a honeybee sometimes. So you have to really know how to tell the difference. But uh, I, I would suggest if you looked at a lot of pictures and figured it out how to tell the difference, you'd discover that yes, you have squash bees in your garden, in your zucchini flowers. They're kind of everywhere. Um, they're quite gentle, they're quite friendly, and they do a great job of pollinating. 
but they fly quite a distance. Bees can travel to your neighbor's garden, to the garden up the street, to the garden you know, on another block and back and forth. And by visiting squash, pumpkin, zucchini, acorn squash, all of those different kinds of squash, they can all uh, interpollinate. The bees can just carry pollen from all kinds of other varieties to pollinate your flowers. And that means when you save the seeds from your squash or zucchini, um, you don't know which pollen was used to fertilize those seeds. And so you don't know which of those seeds are um, hybrids of other varieties and which of them are going to, to come true. It's, uh, it's a much more difficult thing than with self-pollinating plants like tomatoes and beans. And cross-pollination by wind is even more complicated. There's our spinach over on the left. Um, and, and this is a picture of corn. I like the, the illustration of the corn better than an actual picture because you can really see the parts of it. Uh, in the corn, the pollen is made in the tassel up at the top. It dumps all sorts of pollen out into the air and it blows all around. If you've ever been in a cornfield during pollination season, um, you can see pollen all over the leaves of the corn. You can see a light dusty yellow on the ground sometimes. If there are any puddles, you'll see on the surface of the puddles, this, this sort of yellow dust, it's the corn pollen. The corn makes so much pollen because most of it doesn't land where it needs to go. What it needs to do is to land on those threads, those silky threads that are on the end of every ear. And when you've eaten sweet corn, you know those, those kind of thread things on the end of the ear that you sort of peel off when you husk the corn. Um, those are actually where the pollen lands and goes to each kernel. So each of those is sort of like a, like a little tube that carries one grain of pollen to each kernel in the ear of corn. The pollen needs to land on the end of each of those threads. They're called silks. And the chances of that is pretty, is pretty, uh, pretty low because they're very small. So the corn has to make a gigantic amount of pollen and it blows in the air and it blows in the wind. So if you're downwind from a cornfield, even a few miles away, you'll have corn pollen from that field settling on your corn. It makes it a little difficult for us to preserve heritage varieties of corn because in many places where people grow um, sweet corn, there are cornfields nearby. We won't talk about that too much. We're going to focus our examples on the self-pollinating plants, but I want to give some uh, sense of, of what this means for how far apart you can put these plants. When we talk about um, self-pollinating plants like tomato and bean, the distances that we would like to put them apart are, are fairly small. And we give two numbers to this. We talk about community standards for isolating plants, and we talk about commercial standards. So. Uh, Commercial, obviously it means that's for seed companies. If, we're, if you were running a seed company, we would ask you to plant your tomatoes at least 15 meters apart so that they wouldn't cross. And then you would get high quality seeds with very, very few cross pollinations. Put your beans six meters apart, put your squash a kilometer and a half from any other squash to prevent the cross pollination. That's pretty far. Um, most of us, with backyard gardens can't possibly do that. So we have another set of standards, which we call community standards. And these are going to give you good quality seeds. They might not be up to the standard of a seed company, but if you follow our community standards, you'll get good seeds. They'll be good for your own use. They'll be good enough for saving uh, and giving to other people at a seed swap. If you're exchanging seeds in a, a kind of a CD Saturday kind of context, you'll get good results with the community standards. Um, you'll just find that they might cross slightly more often, say maybe one out of 20 seeds might, might have a, uh, an off type in it. That's not good enough for a seed company, but it is achievable in a backyard garden and it's pretty good. So that's what, that's what we recommend for backyard for your own use. Incidentally, for commercial seed production, you see at the bottom, they're aiming for 99.8% uh, uniformity in the seeds. And that's why the, the very, very uh, large isolation distances are recommended for commercial seed production. 
So we've talked about how to get the timing right, thinking about when your seeds are, are ripe. Tomato seeds are ripe when the fruit is ripe. Bean seeds are ripe a little bit later than the time when you would harvest the uh, green and yellow pods. Um, lettuce seeds are ripe about six weeks after you eat the lettuce. We've talked about how many plants do you need for seed? And it's, it's not very many. If you only need a few seeds for your own garden, you can get those seeds from just a few plants, but we do encourage you to save a few seeds from lots of different plants, as many as you can, so that you get a good assortment of genetics and not, you don't have this bottleneck effect of losing useful characteristics in the next generations. So let's map it out. Let's see what we can do. Let's say I have a garden that's seven meters by three meters. And for those of us who don't think in meters, that's about 23 feet by 10 feet. So it's a, uh, it's a backyard garden. It's a pretty, pretty substantial backyard garden. And I would like to plant eight different kinds of plants in here and save them for seeds. I have a, a red tomato and a yellow tomato, and I have a yellow bean and a green bean. I have two kinds of peas, one with green peas and one with purple peas, and I have two kinds of lettuce, a, a green lettuce and a red lettuce. Somehow I want to organize these in my garden so that they are separated by the, the community seed isolation standards. I need the tomatoes to be five meters apart and the beans, lettuce, and peas to be three meters apart from each other. So it's kind of like a puzzle. Let's see, the first thing I can think of is the tomatoes have to be a little further apart. So I'll do this. It's the only way to get five meters in between them. So there we go. Fine. What about the beans? I can see if I put the beans here, then there's three meters apart. So the yellow beans will be three meters apart from the green beans and I will eat some of them and I'll let some of them grow to seed. Now you can do that by either letting some of the pods on every plant ripen, or you can, you can say, I'm going to let some of the pods on half of my row ripen to maturity for seed and I'll eat the pods from the other beans. Uh, there are lots of ways to do it. It's a good idea to save the seeds from at least about 20 bean plants, but that's pretty easy because beans kind of fit close together. We'll get lots of beans in, uh, in this space here. Um, what about my peas? How can I do that? Well, I'll just carry on with the same pattern. If I put the peas like this, then that's really not gonna work. Now, peas also have to be three meters apart from each other. And I have no place to put the lettuce where they would be three meters apart from each other. So this is, this is not working. All right, I'll back up. Let's say, what if I move the green beans over so they're like this? Now, they're kind of close to the yellow beans, right? There's sort of two meters in between the yellow beans and the green beans, but if I measured from the middle of the row, from the middle of each square, one, two, three, that's like three meters. So that's sort of kind of cheating, but it's kind of close. It might work, and I can do the same thing with the peas. And now they're sort of three meters apart. They're kind of like two and a half. But I still don't have any place to put the lettuce. So this really has not worked out. OK. Start over. OK, I like, I like where the tomatoes are, because they have to be five meters apart. So that makes sense. What if I start out thinking this way? What if I, what if I say I'll, I'll plant a whole bunch of yellow beans in the top left square meter and the green beans over on the right and the peas in each of those corners. And those are gonna be for seed saving. I can get 20, say, uh, beans and pea plants in each of those square meters, I can I can grow them sort of intensively and get them like so I can save seeds from 20 plants. That should be enough for a good population. And those are the only uh, squares that I'll use for seed saving. I'll use the rest of these squares for eating. So what if I put others like this? 
Now see what I've done here. I have the yellow beans for eating in the bottom left. So it's still pretty far away from the green beans that I'm saving seeds. That's, that's three meters, so that should work. And the same is true that the, uh, the green beans oh, at the bottom are the same distance away from the yellow beans at the top. And the same is true for the peas. I just, I just, it's like a mirror image. So, okay, so this is good. Now I can save the seeds. I still have some that I can use for eating. So this is fine. Basically, I'm gonna eat these and I'm gonna save seeds from the squares that are in the gray borders. Okay, great. Now, what about my lettuce? If I put lettuce here, and this makes sense because I can do the same sort of thing. If I save the seeds from the lettuce on the ends, then they're far enough apart from each other that they won't cross pollinate. They're three meters apart. But wait a minute, that's not true because I have lettuce in the middle. The green lettuce in the middle is only two meters away from my seed saving lettuce, the red one over on the right. But no, it's a trick because I'm not going to let these three lettuces in the middle grow all the way until they make flowers. I'm just going to keep them um, at the eating stage and I'm going to pick them and eat them. And if they don't make flowers, then they can't cross pollinate. So really these three lettuces in the middle section, they don't count as far as isolation is concerned because they're not going to make flowers. So they can't pollinate, perfect. And the advantage of that is now I have some space here where I can plant something else. I might want some spinach. I might want to plant some radishes or some squash. Now we said before that if I plant squash and save seeds from it, I have to keep it 400 meters away from other squash. Well, maybe that's, that's a topic for another talk on how we can, we can do that. There's a hand pollination method that we can use, but that's in another video. And the other advantage of this is that once I've eaten the lettuce in the middle, those spaces will open up in the middle of the summer. And so I can use those for planting something else. I can think of that right now, realizing that if I plant my lettuce, say in April, that I will probably eat it by June. And that's still early enough to plant other things. Like I could have some cabbage there. I could plant more lettuce there. I could put more spinach on there, all, all sorts of things that you can still plant in June. So I can keep my seed saving garden intact. I can come up with a, a good plan for uh, what I'll plant after I have eaten the lettuce. And I can grow a lot more things in here than I thought I could. Great. So we talked about how we get the timing right. We talked about the fact that some plants ripen their seeds early and some a little bit later. We talked about how um, some plants you can you can uh, eat the same, same part as you save the seeds. So with tomatoes, you just grow the tomatoes and save the seeds while you eat them. Others like beans, you're, you're going to pick some of them for green beans and yellow beans, but leave others to grow uh, until they're fully brown and dry. Other plants like lettuce, you have to have some plants for seed and other plants for eating. You can't use the same plants for both. We talked about the fact that you can get lots of seeds from just a few plants, but really it is wise to save a few seeds from lots of plants and mix them together. And we figured out how to make a, a garden that will um, give us a good seed crop and also lots of good food to eat. So thank you all uh, for watching this video. Um, check out Seeds of Diversity's website. We have lots of information, uh, other videos. Um, you can find where to buy your favorite varieties of seeds from seed companies in Canada. And uh, be sure to check out our seed exchange. Our members are offering thousands of different kinds of seeds through the mail to other members. And I thank you very much.